when you see Earth from outer space, very quickly realize why it's nicknamed the Blue Planet. Because although we call it Planet Earth, it really should be Planet Water because almost 80% of its surface is covered with water. And there's even more water in the atmosphere and underground. So when you take that in consideration, Earth is really a water planet. But that's actually very important because what we understand about life is that wherever there is life, there is water. And so we think that wherever there's liquid water, there may be life. Which is why scientists trying to find life outside of our planet are concerned with finding planets that could support liquid water. There may be some liquid water in Mars, or there may have been liquid water in Mars in the past. There's a moon in our solar system called Europa that may have liquid water underneath massive ice sheets. But there's actually a lot of water period around the universe. In our solar system, there's water in the atmosphere of many of the planets. There's also water in frozen form in a lot of comets and a lot of planets as well. But scientists are wanting to find liquid water. And the Earth got really lucky because we are close enough at, from the sun so the water was not going to be completely frozen. And we're far enough from the sun that the water is not simply going to evaporate, you know, and be blown off by solar winds. So we are just in the right place. We call this place the habitable zone. So planetary scientists and astrobiologists, which are studying planets outside of our solar system and trying to find life outside the Earth, or at least the possibility of life outside the Earth, Try to research planets which will be in this magical habitable zone. Uh, it's a zone where life could come because it could have liquid water. So that just comes to show you how important liquid water is. In our planet, a majority of the water is going to be salt water. And that's actually going to cover 75% of the surface of our planet. And that's 97% of the water in our planet is going to be in the salt oceans of the world. That leaves about 3% for fresh water. And of that fresh water, of that 3%, almost 70% of it is going to be frozen in ice caps and glaciers. So, you know, that's why, you know, when the Earth is warming up, we can think about sea level rise because a lot of the fresh water is going to be in ice caps and, and, and glaciers. And so as the world warms up, that could, you know, join the oceans again. A lot of water also is going to be in the groundwater. That means underground in, a, in what we call the water table. That leaves about only 1%, if you have to take away the 30% from the groundwater, of surface water, which is easily accessible for drinking. And that's the water that's usually going to be tapped into by ecosystems. There's a lot of plants that try to get to the water table with long roots, but for the most part, it's the surface water that matters. Of the surface water, the majority of it is going to be in lakes, and then you're going to have about 11% in swamps and 2% in rivers. Lakes being 87% of the total. So when you look at the surface water, which is less than, you know, 0.3% of the chunk that was fresh water, which is 3% of the total chunk of water, you look at the fact that there's very little surface water that's available. Now, the interesting thing is that for the most part, that surface water is not going to be necessarily drinkable or potable water that's accessible for organisms to drink. Because, unfortunately, as humans have spread around the world, we have damaged or polluted the environment. And through air pollution, ground pollution, and water pollution, we've actually damaged a lot of the natural occurring water at the surface of the earth and even some of the groundwater. So when you look at all of that, you think of the fact that there's a condition on the earth where we're actually disrupting the natural flow of water and causing problems for the ecosystem. And we're going to get to a point that we might get to water scarcity. We'll talk about that in a second. But here's some of the reasons that humans need water for their society. We use water for agricultural purposes, and that's actually the number one reason why we need water. The second reason is industrial applications. A lot of the processes that we do in, in factories and other manufacturing uh, plants actually require water. And that's actually the number two reason in the world why water is used. Uh, far behind agriculture, but in some industrialized countries, that actually is going to be the reason number one for why water is used. And then you also, of course, have household uses, which of which the leading cause of water use in your house is probably flushing the toilet which talks about the need for a better uh, toilets, you know, that we flush using less water. Then it's obviously washing clothes, taking showers, washing the car, and then a minority of the water is actually for human consumption. Then you also have, of course, the lawns that people, you know, it's kind of like goes in the same area as agriculture. It's for irrigation purposes. We also use water not just to actually consume it or to use it to grow or, or all these things we just talked about, but also we use it to produce electricity uh, through hydroelectrical dams, to tidal power or current power, water power, 
or using the movement of water, kinetic energy of moving water, is actually one of the leading ways by which uh, energy in the world is produced. And so water is very important for humanity. Now the problem is that, like I just said before, there's a problem with water scarcity in our planet. Now although there are a lot of countries that don't currently have the problem with that, there's a lot of places on the earth where there's a physical shortage of water. And that means there's basically too dry for having water. And then there's some places which are not necessarily too dry, but there's just way too many people living in those places, in all in one place, in large cities, without too much water and or enough water to support their, them. And then you also have the fact that humans will start tapping into the natural ecosystems, disrupting the natural water flow. They will affect the water cycle and cause disruptions to that as well. So when you look at all of that, we get what it's called economic water scarcity. There's water for some, but not for all in these places. Now, this interesting thing is that such places like Central Africa, South America, and Southeastern Asia represent the developing countries of the world, which are now starting to explode in population. And that means the places where most of the water is needed or it's scarce are the places that we have the least. And that is, raises causes for concern. And so as a human race, we have to start thinking about our impact in the water of the world. Because as we use water for all the things I just said we use water for, we actually have to think about where are we getting that water from? Are we getting it from natural ecosystems? Are we tapping into the, in the water cycle? Are we disrupting? Are we going to have water for the future? Sustainable use of water means actually giving enough back to the environment so that it can allow itself to recover. So in other words, give more than you take. If we started actually cleaning the water that we use, in other words, actually kind of recycling or reusing the water, then we would actually have a better chance of actually have sustainable development in water for our future. The technology is already in place to almost completely clean the water that we use, even if we actually look at sewage and industrial waste and things like that. That's the kind of things that they do into the National Space Station and how astronauts live you know, uh, they get their water from, you know, they just reuse the water. So purification systems already exist. Of course, they're very expensive. So it's easier or simpler to just tap into natural ecosystems, disrupt the water cycle, and then cause the water scarcity problem to become even greater. We also have to think about how can we conserve water? How can we lose less? And of course, thinking about using better irrigation and industrial application procedures is the number one way that countries can do this. But even in your household, you can make a difference. If you use uh, less water to wash hands, to take showers, and appliances that use less water to wash clothes, you know, if, you, if your lawn is not watered all the time or excessively, and if you use a flushing technology that's actually more advanced, uh, including things like reusing the water from other places on the routes to flush and things like that, it would be more advantageous and then we could save more water. So that's why a lot of people are investing money in finding these ways to conserve water. And the last thing, of course, is that as we grow as a human race, we have to talk about the, think about the fact that if we concentrate around cities, especially in areas where water is not abundant, we're going to cause an economic water shortage problem. There's just not going to be enough water to support that many people in one place. And even the countries where water shortage is not currently a problem, it may become a problem if we don't start wisely using what it is, a renewable resource, but the resource that requires a little bit of time to recover. Of course, we call it a water cycle, which is what we're going to talk about in the next video. I'll see you guys then.